Now I'd like to introduce our plenary speakers, Drs. David Oliver and Deborah Parker Oliver from the University of Missouri. Following a diagnosis of stage 4 nasopharyngeal carcinoma with widespread metastases to bone, David and his wife Deborah decided to go public about his disease to create a dialogue about experiences related to cancer diagnosis, treatment, hospice and palliative care, and eventually death and bereavement. Using social media to produce and disseminate teaching videos, they have taken the world into their home to witness this dramatic journey. More than 50,000 people have viewed their blog and YouTube videos. And now, with their new ebook, they have and will continue to make an impact. Today, they will share with us what it has been like to go from gerontologist to patient and researcher to caregiver, including many of the difficult decisions they have had to make along the way. They will tell us what they need from hospice and palliative care, what this journey has meant to them, and how going public has created important teachable moments. Please remember to tweet your questions using the hashtag HPMQ hashtag. The Oliver's friend and colleague and Academy member, Dr. Paul Tatum, will be moderating the question and answer session following their presentation. Please join me in welcoming Drs. David and Deborah Oliver. Wow, it's kind of overpowering when you're up here and you see um, all of you uh, out there. Um, Amazing. I've been involved in hospice and palliative care for 30 years um, as a social worker, uh, hospice administrator. And um, 25 years ago, we sent our medical director uh, to Granby, Colorado, to be a part of the forming of this academy. And so to see um, that growth is, is pretty amazing. Normally, we would be here to talk about some scholarly subject, um, but today it's a little different and, uh, quite frankly, a little more challenging because we're here to share our personal story and our personal journey, and we're here as a patient and as a caregiver. Well, we thought maybe the best way to uh, kick this off would be to show you a very short clip from CBS. It was our one moment of fame. They uh, flew us to New York Studios to do a live interview, and and we're just going to do the first part of the collage they put together to give you the kind of context of what's going on here. So let's roll it. In today's Health Watch, learning how to live and how to die. A professor who has spent decades teaching others how to care for dying patients is now terminally ill. And he's still teaching using his own case and the Internet. Before we meet him, National Correspondent Lee Cowan takes a look at his very public illness. The day David Oliver got his death sentence was a day like any other, except that suddenly it meant that no day could be wasted. How long do I have? You know, we don't know. For the medical school professor at the University of Missouri, death became a teachable moment, and the web became his chalkboard. And if there was ever a time to be a good teacher, you know, this is it. At first, he couldn't even pronounce the cancer that he would live with and die by. It's called nasal gerin... Uh, you know, I'm going to have to look at this. But he quickly got the hang of it. Nasal pharyngeal cancer. It's behind the nose. And of all the lessons he had to offer, perhaps taking control was what made his blog so poignant. If he was going to lose his hair, it was going to be on his terms, not the cancers. Here's looking at you. See you around. These medications... His lectures outline his cocktail of chemo, their grim side effects, and the upside of fighting through. But maybe a little nausea. It's not so bad uh, if you're... If, the, on the other hand, you get a chance to go see your grandson play in the state championship football game in St. Louis, Missouri, which I'm going to do. It's important. you got to choose. He's somber, he's funny, but most of all, blunt. It's not curable, but it is manageable. And, you know, I could get three to five years if the chemotherapy works six months. If it doesn't. In the few short months of treatment, the difference is painfully obvious, especially compared to that first day. We're going to get through it, and it's going to be okay. 
It's going to be all right. His positive attitude is infectious and instructive. If there is an art to living, he's teaching there's an art in dying, too. For CBS This Morning, I'm Lee Cowan in Los Angeles. <sighs> Professor That's David good. Oliver is with us. That's what steroids does to you. In <laughs> <laughs> Let's let's get that, rid of that one. You know, we, that's enough. <laughs> well, uh, you know, this is a huge gathering. You should stand up here and see this. I I am really nervous more than ever. So you got to help me with this, okay? Uh, I uh, this morning. Did you see on the video where I went? It's going to be okay. It's going to be good. I've been doing that in front of the mirror in my bathroom all morning. I've been doing it because this friend of mine said, David, if you're... <laughs> I've been doing this because this friend of mine said, you know, if you get nervous, go into your bathroom, look in the, in the mirror and go, hey, it's going to be good. It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. And then go out and give your speech. Well, that's pretty good advice, except a couple years ago I was at this large gathering, nothing like this. And I was nervous, and the hostess came over, and she said, David, are you ready? And I said, I've got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so I go in the bathroom, and I walk in, and I think it's empty. <laughs> and I do it out loud. I look in the mirror, and I say, hey, it's going to be good. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. And just at that moment, this guy flushes his stool in, in the stall. And I just freeze. And he walks out and he walks behind me and he says, I hope it is. And then I know he thought I was going to go to the bathroom. So I'm relaxed now. And we'll get on with this, Debbie. Let's go for it. If you can imagine, heaven help our health care team. The goal of what we want to do today is um, kind of expressed best by an ancient philosopher who said, to begin depriving death of its greatest advantage over us, let us adopt a way clean and contrary to that common one. Let us deprive death of its strangeness. Let us frequent it. Let us get used to it. We do not know where death awaits us, so let us wait for it everywhere. And that's what we're all about. And that's what hospice and palliative care are all about. To begin with any story, you need to begin to understand where patients come from. And I have to tell you, we were married 17 years ago. We have a happy Brady Bunch family. And we've been incredibly blessed. And our goal when we began our life together was to see the world. And we've been very lucky. We have stood at the base of the pyramids, walked on the great walls, been at the base of the Acropolis, uh, been through the Strait of uh, Magellan in South America. And so staying and doing those things on that bucket list continue to be important to us now and are a part of that story. And we have only accelerated that journey. So when you get this diagnosis... After you've been on all these nice journeys. And you know, the doctor says, you know, you have cancer. And that wasn't too bad. But then he says to Debbie, she said, well, what stage? He said, stage four. And that just was paralyzing. I just want you to know, that's just really stunning. It makes your knees go weak. And you do think, God, what am I going to do? And that's the first thing. And then you, and then you wonder, what are you going to say? What do you, what do you tell people? How do you, yeah, and, and I went to my primary care doc, my closest friend and physician. I said, Steve, what do I do? He said, David, I don't know. You just got to figure it out. But I do know one thing. If you go up to someone and they know that you have cancer, but they don't know that you know that they know that you have cancer, it makes it really awkward. In fact, there may not be a conversation at all. They may avoid it. So you've got to make them comfortable. 
It's on your shoulders. So I create the first video, which was for family medicine at the University of Missouri faculty, and just to tell them what happened. And those puke buckets, you know, aren't they great? And the chemicals they give you for chemo, you know, they keep you from puking. That was unfortunate, because now I had these buckets and didn't know what to do. The Jayhawk bucket, I put other things in it. The Oklahoma Sooner bucket, I gave it to my friend Kevin Craig right down here. What a pathological Sooner fan. But then eventually, you know, what are you going to do? I found that there's about three responses to this. There's a group of people who, who withdraw and they disengage and they withdraw from life. And then there, there's a group that's going to fight it. I mean, fight it so much almost to futility. And then, then there's my group, which is a little bit smaller, I think. They kind of decide to accept it like it is. And I'm so glad I did that. And it wasn't like that in the beginning. I got this diagnosis and all my friends said, David, you can fight it. It was going to be a battle. It was going to be a war. And with my positive attitude, I would win it. And my daughter created an early website called David versus Cancer. Big mistake. Four days later, I finally called my 94-year-old mentor in St. Louis. I said, Fred... I got this diagnosis. He said, I know. He said, you got a pencil. I said, what is it? He said, you ready? One, don't panic. Two, don't struggle. Three, relax. Four, accept it. It is what it is. And that's what I've been doing. It was like a load of bricks were released and I was free to free to live and not focus on the dying and I must say not to jump too far ahead in the story how good it is Uh, in chemo my life would have been a whole lot more into living and into comfort had palliative care, been there in the beginning and during chemo. Palliative care. These two are inseparable, and we've got to change that. At any rate, I began to learn how hard this was going to be. The reality of it really set in. You see, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and uh, hear Debbie crying. And uh, even still. You know, there are two patients here. It's not just the person that's dying. It's the caregiver. Two patients. And I think the caregiver really suffers the most. And so in your work, the caregiver is really important. In the end, one of... Your two patients dies. And the other is left alone. Not much of a reward, is it? So the strategies for me is, what I've learned on this is, this is hard. I need help. And I'm not going to fight it. you got to die something. Debbie? I have the same question. Oh, my God. Um, matter of fact, I remember having a, a conversation with Paul um, during our diagnosis period. I've done hospice and palliative care my whole life, 30 years, my whole professional life. Thank God I've shared journeys, as have all of you, with incredible people along the way. But even I was unprepared for that. Somehow I... Yes, I thought we buy immunity. I'm sorry to say we don't. Um, And having that experience also gives you an incredible bias when you go to face a cancer diagnosis as a person instead of as a professional. Um, People would say, you know, how do you do hospice? Oh, yuck. Um, I would say, how do you do oncology? Oh, yuck. 
uh, how many hospice patients do you know that say, I sure wish we hadn't got in so early. Uh, no. They say, where have you been, right? And how many success stories when you're in hospice do you hear about chemotherapy? Um, none. I was also lucky in my professional capacity to meet um, an amazing man who's also become a personal friend of ours, Dr. Clay Anderson. And once at a state organization, we had had this conversation. I said, I can't imagine ever going through chemotherapy. He said, okay, we're going to make a deal. If you end up with a cancer diagnosis, you call me. I don't care where you are. And you come. And I promise to be honest. Because quite frankly, I hadn't heard a lot of honesty out of oncologists. So guess who we called? And we went and we saw Clay, um, my oncologist who has um, become a reformed and become a palliative care doctor. <laughs> um, so it's true, we didn't have formal palliative care, but we kind of generated our own resources. At diagnosis, before treatment, um, little to our medical oncologist, did he know, I mean, we had a treatment schedule, but we went to see Clay before we actually had made that final decision. I actually think that we probably were not going to do it until after we talked to him. He told us three things, and I think they're really important, and it's all about what palliative care can do at diagnosis. The first is that we could jump off that train any time we wanted, that we were in charge. And boy, in the healthcare system, you don't feel that way. And reminding us that we had the power to quit if we wanted to, to do that was very, very helpful. Secondly, he explained the progression of the symptoms and how it's going to get worse with each additional treatment so that we could plan around that and expect it. And so all of our travel that he knew we'd love to do, he said, you've got things to do and places to go. Do it in the third week and do it as early as possible. And we did a lot of that. And last, he began to help us understand that there's going to be a cycle to those treatments that it's going to be a little bit better by the end and a little worse at the beginning. Now, I don't know why our oncology team didn't share these things, but they didn't. Partly because they didn't know us. And that's a big difference. I also um, trained a palliative care social worker, and um, so I called her up, and we sat down, and I said, I wrote a paper on how to redefine hope, but I can't find it. I can't, I can't find any hope. My normal solution would be to go to the literature, and I'll tell you there's no hope in this cancer in the literature. And uh, she, she was very helpful and gave me some books to read and said, you know, all that saying you kept telling people all those years, take a day at a time, you've got to take one step at a time through this process, step by step. Hope lies in the next step, not in the end. See, in hospice, we're, we see the end. And so consequently, the strategies that I came up with were first to realize my life would never be the same again. And it doesn't mean it had to be bad. It just had to change. And that while I might distrust the oncology, I could have trust in palliative care. And that was an easy sell for me. And that hope lies in taking things step by step. And so we learned over time as we did these videos, the response to them has just really been overwhelming. With that first video, I, my intention was not to inspire anyone. I just wanted to tell people what was going on. But these videos just really went viral. And there's, it's 58,000, 59,000 hits on that blog so far from 74 different countries. And I learned, you know, this is a lot bigger than the David Oliver story. This is going on all over the world of people dying from this insidious, cunning really baffling uh, disease. And uh, we got so many responses. I'm going to read about three or four responses that are really neat. And except I should tell you about the law professor who called and said, from uh, Oklahoma, by the way, <laughs> who said, what's the deal with the puke bucket? So. <laughs> but other nicer comments. <laughs> A big hug from Argentina. 
We even got replies from Iran. You are a true inspiration for all of us. Best regards. This one from Mexico. Another one. I've spent more than 17 years of my working life at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And please believe me when I say that what you are doing is of real benefit to a great many people facing this same kind of journey. I have seen firsthand that a positive attitude can really tilt the odds into your favor. And another. This undoubtedly is the best and most important teaching opportunity you've ever had. Your videos will help many people who are experiencing any type of serious situation. And each step shared helps someone, each step you are sharing helps someone else along the way. Thank you. And it goes on and on. And uh, it's been very gratifying. And it's, uh, my strategies for all this is, to, you know, let's take control and, and uh, make a difference in the time I have left. And, of course, we're hoping this makes a difference and uh, finding meaning and purpose and uh, these videos are doing it for me now don't worry that's not a beer <laughs> that's O'Doul's <laughs> yeah chemo cafe had never seen anything quite like it before that's what we call the AIU we hate that term um, so I had the same thing it's bigger than me um, I am an introvert and you can tell I have an opposite partner here, uh, and I am not one to show public emotion um, at all, and yet I awake on a Saturday or Sunday morning, and there's my back uh, on the front page of our paper, and an AP reporter had followed us around and done some interviewing with us, and we thought, you know, okay, this is going to like be no big deal and the next thing we know CBS ABC NBC are calling us that very morning um, it, it was pretty amazing and so suddenly I realized that now I'm going to have to learn to share my emotions publicly and David is finding great meaning in this I'm finding great nerves in it <laughs> um, however suddenly it hit me um, I have worked so hard in palliative care, and I have been such an advocate for caregivers that now is an opportunity for me to live that and be a voice for people who don't have a voice. And so in this process, I've also been able to find some purpose and meaning in what we're doing and to be that voice for people who are not heard. And you see, the caregivers don't get heard because everybody's really listening a lot to the patient. And I'm just going to remind you that hospice and palliative care are about the patient and the family. And so everybody's saying, how are you? How are you? And everybody tries to think that they can explain the medications to him, and he's completely confused and clueless. And I'm the one that's having to, do, to manage all of that. So take a minute and ask the caregiver, too. My strategies have been also to try to take control where I can and when I can and set my boundaries around that and also find a difference and try to, to be a voice um, for those who need to have that. So the next big learning uh, along this journey has been the decisions. As Dr. Clay Anderson told us early on, David and Debbie, Cancer is a journey, it's, it's a trajectory, and there are many markers along the way. You're going to have a lot of decisions to make, and each one has its pros and its cons. And that has proven, Clay, to be true at every point. And you know, what bothers me, though, if I had a board, a magic board here to write on and to lecture, what's missing in the trajectory is for the oncologist to say to me, David, what are, your, what are your preferences? That has never been asked to this day from my oncology team. What is your preference? My primary care doc and my palliative care team that finally is in action, certainly uh, talk to me about that. But not the oncology team. When I was faced with, uh, do you want chemo or chemo and radiation, uh, you know, and so on. But never did anyone say, well, David, do you want none? Which I thought was a pretty good option, actually. 
These patient preferences are, is the mis- missing ingredient. And if, if you don't get in there, then you get sucked in to this health care system run by oncologists who, you know, think they're going to save your life. And what happens is you begin to depend on these quarterly reports, I call them. You know, like a business corporation kind of lives and dies on these three-month quarterly reports, you know. You know, how do we do? What are the profits? What, what are the results? It's no difference with cancer. Every three months, at the beginning, of course, it was every six weeks. But every three months, you know, in the anxiety that you get before those PET scans is just enormous. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm still not sure why I need PET scans. Because uh, what if I've decided, really, I don't think I'm going to go through another round. So why spend all that money? I'm still curious about that. And I want to say it again. What I had wished that my patient preferences were taken into account at the beginning and that the palliative care and oncology people were on the same team listening to my case, listening to my preferences, and developing one plan of care. And so my strategy, by the way, that's my oncologist. I do love him very much, I want you to know. But be strong, know your preferences, stick to them. A lot of people just simply aren't being asked what they are. And family and caregivers have lots of decisions that have to be made as well. All along the way, David has actually talked about the continuum of care his entire professional life. In gerontology and geriatrics, we know it continues to be a problem there, too. And he would say, who's my quarterback? Are you my quarterback? He said that to the surgeon. The surgeon said, yes, I'm your quarterback. We never saw him again. Um, <laughs> That's the last time we saw the surgeon. <laughs> yeah. said to, uh, to the radiation oncologist the, the same day, actually, are, are you my quarterback? He actually was a little bit more honest. He said, it's probably going to be the doctor who sees you the most which seemed to be a little bit more true. However, what we found out really is that I get to be the quarterback without a lot of training. I'm a social worker. Now, I'm lucky in that I've been around for a while and I'm more literate than most people, but that doesn't mean that I have all the answers. And I've never really paid attention to things like lab values and all that stuff and names of medicines, which we did that video on that. It's insane. Wish that they would call things what they really are. Um, And so I've had to learn that stuff. Now, again... Our initial palliative care consult with our dear friend, he said, I'm going to be mad at you if I hear one thing, that you're in the hospital because somebody didn't give you blood. They let your hemoglobin drop too low. So you must advocate to the death for blood if your hemoglobin drops below 10. I'm like, great, okay, I got a magic number. I talked to my oncologist, we talked to our our residents, they're like, yep. 9.9 9.9 or no problem. So we're going along, all is well. The last treatment, of course, the worst, the most difficult, and he's not getting better. We created this 21 day cycle. It's in the video. It's amazingly helpful. I don't know why it's not widely known or shared. And he, it wasn't happening to normal. So I forced him, literally forced him, to go to the hospital. Sure enough, his hemoglobin was down. He was dehydrated. Um, But, of course, there was a different fellow on call. And, of course, they said, no, we don't get blood till 8. I'm going, "Mm, no, I don't think so. And so we went back and forth. She called my oncologist or our oncologist. He said, yeah, you can. David's going, no, I don't want to be a big trouble. Can you imagine that from him? (laughs) But he's like this other person I don't recognize. He's like, no, just take me home. Just take me home. I had to get on the phone and call who... Our very best friend and palliative, now palliative care doctor to help intercede to make that happen. 
I see it all as a caregiver. I know what it's like at home. I know him well enough to know if he's telling the truth or not. And that's not always easy. And um, I, I'm the one that's going to force him to take, to take action at times. And we had to be a strong advocate. And sure enough, he got blood. And sure enough, three days later, we were able to make the cruise ship that we had planned on going. Not that he remembers much about it. But we were there at any rate. So what have I learned? I'm the quarterback. I've got to have boundaries. I can't tell you how difficult it is to have this on a personal side and then have this be my business. And some of you have shared with me that you've gone through that, and I really appreciate that. You walk into my office, every book, every paper on my desk is about what this business, right? And death and dying and caregiving specifically, which is what I face. So there are days I can't do that. Um, there are times I can't read our data. I can't read this, the stories. They're, they're too close at home. But I'm learning in order to set those boundaries. And mostly I need the courage to go through this. The end of life, I'm a little more familiar with. It's a little less fearful for me. That's more fearful for David. It's this current journey that is a little bit more fearful for me. So, I have coffee with my primary care physician uh, most Mondays. And, you know, he said to me, he said, David, uh, share with me your hopes for the future. And tell this conference, I didn't know that was a standard question. (laughs) And no one had ever asked me that. And I thought it was really a good question. And I had to think about it for a while. And I said, well, Steve, uh, I want to die well. He said, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, you know, I want to die well. (laughs) Yeah. I want to tell you. That filling out an advanced directive, and I hope everyone here has, that's a lot easier to do when you're healthy. But putting together an advanced directive when you have a death sentence, it's a lot harder. And Debbie, I got home and I said, Steve asked me what my hopes for the future was were, and he, I said to die well. She said, what does that mean? <laughs> And she pushed me, and she pushed me. Love it. Yeah. (laughs) So what I did, I made it simple. I developed an acronym, and it is my exit strategy. And I thought the acronym would be easy because uh, I wanted my family to grasp it fully. I wanted my palliative care team to grasp it, and especially my oncology team to grasp it. And the acronym is HOPE. Pretty simple. The H is, I hope, the H is for dying at home. Who doesn't want to die at home? And so Debbie won't, is unrelenting. What does that mean? And I said, well, are you going to get me a hospital bed? Well, maybe, probably. Well, it better have rollers. I want to be able to roll to the dining room table. It's, we got a big one. I said, I want to roll to the TV, and I want to roll out on the porch to see the birds and the squirrels and the coyotes. She said, done. O is for others. I'm a social kind of guy. Maybe you picked that up. You know, and I want other, you got to make others comfortable. Nobody else is. The patient is the one that has to put other people at ease. And that's okay. And I'm doing my best job at it. Maybe not with Jayhawks or Sooners. But I want to be surrounded by others at the time. P is for pain-free. You guys are experts at managing pain. There is no reason in America for anyone to suffer from pain. No one. I have made it clear that I want pain medication even if it means I'll be unconscious and unaware of what's going on around me. And that's going to be clear to everybody. And then I can't hear the jokes they're saying about me either. (laughs) 
The E is for being ex- remain excited about living. As long as I am conscious, you know, I want to be talking about the great Missouri Tigers. And uh, they are great, and they won last night. So that's my strategy, and that's how I hope to die well. And that's part of the joy you have when you have warning in order to be able to have these conversations. And I want David to die well. So now I know the game plan, right? The problem is I need a strategy, too, to make it happen. And as knowledgeable as I am, and as much love and support that we have from our children around us, I realized that I'm going to need help in doing that, too. So I couldn't let him one-up me. I had to come up with my own acronym. (laughs) Courage. Calm in the midst of fear. People say, what are you afraid of? Um, You ask that to a dying person, and a whole lot of them are going to say pain, and it sounds like I finally convinced him we can take care of that. They ask me, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid of lingering and lack of quality of life that we have fought so hard and we give to so many. So I've got to stay calm and believe in that. Organize boundaries. I know it's not easy. Um, I think it was Ira Bayak who said being a caregiver is almost like a diagnosis in and of itself. And I have to work and continue to figure out how to do this work and take care of him all along the, all along the way. Uncertainty while waiting. This is a really hard time. And this is a time that um, those of us in palliative care don't know a lot about, this waiting time. we figuring out how to make plans, and is he going to be here? And we're so thankful that we are, because we didn't know that six months ago. Respite from the ongoing stress, because it's not just even the physical stress. It becomes the emotional stress of going through this all the time and being good to ourselves. And I'm not very good about that. That's not been a part of my normal self-care routine. Asking for help, that's really strange because I've been trained to help, not to ask for help. And um, it was the point at which we had the blood issue that uh, Dr. Craig said, you know, I think it's time we, get palli- we become palliative care patients. And that's kind of unusual because it was so early, but it's been incredibly helpful. you got to ask. Grieving publicly. Um, now we've become public. And so that means there'll be a time when I'll be doing this alone. And that's not a part of who I am. But it's also an important part of what we teach when we teach to deprive death of its strangeness. And lastly, I've got to prepare for the eventual loss. Not done that before either. So what does that mean? Um, How do I develop a re-entry strategy, and how in the world do I do that while he's still here? He keeps asking me about it, and it's very uncomfortable to talk about. Um, So we've got to figure that out. So in conclusion... This is both a shared journey... And an individual journey. Requiring hope. And courage. Thanks a lot. Thank you. A lot of love. Thank you, Debbie and David. This is off script, and I won't take much time, but in a word, brilliant. Brilliant. So I am Twitter handle Doc Tatum, at Doc Tatum. You can call me Paul. I'm a colleague, and more importantly, you guys are my friends. And what we're going to do now 
is we're going to take questions. And, you know, please remember what we're going to do here is have you all tweet your questions using the pound HPMQ hashtag. Pound gets it into that hashtag thing. There's a bunch of great ones out there. If you're not on Twitter, please ask a neighbor to tweet Mm -hmm. the questions for you. And, you know, I'm blessed not only because I'm your friend, because I also get to sit next to you every now and then at a Mizzou football game. That's right. First question. First question. Jim Cleary had some great ones. Is there a microphone? Uh, Jim, right here. Uh, Jim Cleary asked, can you talk about how the cancer diagnosis was delivered? And what advice would you give on doctor-patient communication? Uh, delivering bad news. We teach we, we've delivering given, we've bad We've given news. a speech called the bad bringing of bad news. <laughs> So we're, David's in surgery, he's gone through the biopsy, and um, we're the la- my daughter and I are the last ones in the waiting room, and they come out and they take care of the bad news room. Um, and I'm like, mm, and it's gone on longer than it should. So we go in there, and I proceed, she's a nursing student at the time, and I proceed to kind of tell her how the bad news script works so that she'd be prepared. <laughs> Silly me. He walks in, he stands at the door, and he says, we found metastatic disease, I don't know where the primary site is. That's it. Not even hello. Um, And then my daughter, after she picked herself up off the ground, um, being the great nurse advocate that she is, she said, so does dad know yet? And he goes, no, um, I was headed to go tell him now. And she said, do you think we ought to be with him? They weren't planning that. So it was bad. Um, And so communication then between David and him when they did tell him and we were there, was bad. David was still coming out from anesthetic. I don't even know how much he really remembers, but he latched on. The mistake that the surgeon made was to say, I don't know the primary site, but this should be curable. It should be fine. He did not know the primary site, nor did he know that it had been widespread to the bone, nor that it was stage it four, had a pet and made the statement, this is curable. That's why he's not our quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> So, Renee Berry asked, can you speak to the transition from wearing your professional hat do that. to being present personally? Well, obviously, this ought to be Debbie's uh, question. Debbie, by the way, is a uh, NIH $7 million research. I can brag about her. She's uh, in family medicine at the University of Missouri, and Dr. Oliver is a... Uh, I'm proud to be associated with her. And, uh, yeah. Whew. She rocks. Uh, And she, you see, in hospice, as a manager of a hospice and starting uh, uh, two of them, she she was only familiar with the end stage, the end stage of what it's like. And her learning, I can tell you, has been, oh, my God, there's a whole lot of pre-stage that occurs before you get to the end. And so she was kind of unprepared for that and, and has learned a great deal about what that's like, and so have I. Also, the doctors assumed, since I was a scholar in a family medicine department, that I knew a lot. Hell, I didn't know anything. I didn't even know how to pronounce the disease. <laughs> and uh, that's a wrong assumption. I might re- read the New England Journal of Medicine, but I don't understand what I'm reading. Most of the time. And keeping that professional, certainly that professional side was an incredible blessing in many ways in that it gave me a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. But now it gets real tough. But I'm really lucky because i got a dynamic team and I've learned to delegate. And there are days you got to do that. That's the bottom line. So Christian Sinclair asks, oh, how have the healthcare about, professionals uh, viewed your NBC. public demonstration of your journey? Uh, has anybody expressed hesitancy about it? <laughs> NBC Dateline came in to follow us for a day in the cancer center. One of our big complaints in this cancer center was it had Fox News on every <laughs> channel. <laughs> The day the cameras came from NBC 
every channel was turned to NBC. <laughs> And people wore dresses and ties, and it was incredible. <laughs> it was incredible. Uh, somebody said to me, you must have a lot of power now to make change. No. <laughs> uh, how the professionals listened, um, not really. <laughs> we sent them a chapter of the book, but that didn't really go over very well. Uh, the, the direct answer to how do you teach the public to respond, is this the next question? Yeah, so Lyle, Lyle Fedig is asking... How can we teach the public to respond when someone learns the person they're speaking with has an advanced terminal disease? My reason for doing that first video was so people would treat me the same. I told them that you can still come down to the office and expect to be teased and made fun of. And you can give me a hug, too. But I wanted to make them comfortable. And I think it, it worked. Uh, but the pressure, I think, as I said earlier, is on the person with the disease to make the others comfortable. Whether that's fair or not, I think you need to tell your patients to get good at it if they want to have interesting and fun conversations. Sure. Uh, Melissa Gaines asks, did you ask your oncologists or physicians for palliative care during treatments? And if so, what was their response? Okay. In the early days in chemo, uh, through the first five treatments, which is nearly five months, I had 21 days between each treatment. Uh, palliative care was never mentioned by my oncology team. And it was, has always been Debbie and I who have pushed the envelope. In the very beginning, going to Dr. Clay Anderson that uh, Debbie mentioned uh, for, to get a second opinion. We did that on our own. No one suggests that we do it. The key part of this question is, did you ask? And I guess I didn't figure I should have to. And I guess that's been the most disappointing thing to me about the system, is that you have to ask for everything. Now, I have been taught how to advocate for others, but I've n never really been taught to advocate for myself. So when we had questions about things, we would leave and go, don't other people have questions? And I know we've got probably more questions than most people, but surely these same questions get asked of these same healthcare professionals over and over and over. And yet, it, it, volunteer information wasn't coming. We had to ask, and so we've had to learn to ask. And it took a while. If you go to video number four, I talk about those 21 days between treatments and I experienced all 22 side effects and it was it was awkward and it was awful I hated it and and no one on the oncology team told me what to expect and if you look at that video I was able to trace exactly what happens on day one two three and four and so on and of course the first four days you're on those steroids and you feel like Superman I mean to tell you that's a good time although I was driving on the wrong side of the road <laughs> <laughs> and nobody warned me about that. Yeah, right. And but then day five, man, you go downhill, and man, it's awful. And the fatigue and exhaustion is horrible. After a three-hour nap, you're still exhausted, and you have dizziness and, di and and balancing diarrhea and constipation. Man, I think Sinecot is the best drug on the market. <laughs> And I could go through the sores and the, and the metallic and, uh, and the taste and food tasting like cardboard. No one told me about what was coming. Mm. It is a palliative care team I know. Wouldn't you tell me, David, these things are coming and this is how we will help you deal with it as you go down your course of treatment. Um, we're going to move to the next question, but... If you have not seen that video, go see it. Uh, Frank Mueller asks, tell us how this has affected your spirituality and your beliefs. As often asked, and rightfully so, we've had uh, a lot of people praying for us. And if you want to, please do. <laughs> and we appreciate that very, very much and honor it. We've been careful about sharing our personal beliefs because there's a, there's a plethora of beliefs in this room from A to Z. 
And, and Julie, how many foreign countries here represent? Twelve, I think. And you said at the beginning, or Tim, uh, I think it was twelve. And uh, they have different sometimes beliefs, and even within our own boundaries. But I will share this, that Zen has been particularly helpful to me and the Eastern philosophies and Buddhism. And I meditate every day uh, with uh, Zen sayings. I don't understand half of them. <laughs> but I think about them, and I work at it, and I have some... My mentor in St. Louis helps me. And uh, I found it extremely useful. My own spiritual journey, uh, gee, I, I, I'm a Christian, I guess, and uh, I celebrated the Holy Eucharist when John Paul was there. In 1980, uh, I have a uh, cousin who's a, uh, married to a rabbi, and, uh, you know, I've been around the loop. Uh, and I think I'm covered. <laughs> Debbie, do you want to reply? I might just say that, you know, it's spirituality rather than religiosity, and we understand that in palliative care very well. Um, not everybody does. And I think um, how you find your hope and where you find your hope and how you define your hope is all about that. Um, so it's certainly, a, I think it's a continuous journey for both of us. So I, I think it's fair to say we have time for about one more question. Um, you seem to have, well, it's moving. Um, Megan Kilpractic asked, you, you seem to have handled this with such grace. How, how did you both deal with any anticipatory grieving you might have had? Anticipatory grieving. Had. Yeah. <laughs> have is a better word. Um, actually, our palliative care nurse kind of uh, targeted me on that uh, last week uh, by putting that label. I'm a social worker. I should have known it. Uh, it's hard. And those tears in the middle of the night, that's what that's about. Um, and they hit you in waves. And it's something you do every day, every single day. I think anticipatory grief is very important, but I don't want you to work through it too quickly. (laughs) Sometimes it's easy. (laughs) You know the story about Johnny and his turtle, you know, Johnny, Johnny's turtle is on its back and his... And Johnny says, oh, Daddy, my turtle's dead. And so Daddy takes him down in the basement, and they build a little coffin, and Daddy teaches him about death and dying and making this cute little coffin. I mean, they really they worked and worked and worked on the most beautiful little turtle coffin you've ever seen. And then they went up to the aquarium, and here's, here's the turtle swimming around, very much alive. And Daddy said, Johnny, look, your turtle, it's alive. And Johnny looked at it, and he looked at the coffin... And he said, let's kill it. <laughs> so don't work through your anticipatory grieving too quickly, okay? <laughs> oh, you're crazy. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> Um, I, I made the comment earlier, you know, those who know me, I was actually an introvert until I met this guy, right? Actually. Um, I'd like to invite David and Debbie to provide some closing remarks for us now. I just, um, one thing. You get tired doing this work. I know you do. This is not just work. It's real. And there are thousands of people who need you. And somehow we've got to find a way that people don't have to ask for you. But that that happens automatically. And I believe that it was Dr. Quill who said this years ago. We automatically refer to physical therapy when we have a broken hip or a broken uh, replaced knee. Where's palliative care? So be a strong voice and don't ever think that what you do doesn't matter. Uh, just two quick things uh, a request and some advice the request just take care of my Debbie okay will you do that <laughs> my advice is to laugh hard 
sing out loud, dance with abandon, and love fiercely. Yes. Ooh.